Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here or have been sitting in the shadows and you enjoy what you are hearing, please show that subscriber button some love and make sure you set those notification bells to all. That way you get reminded of every time I upload, which tends to be daily. Also, if you would like to learn how to become a member of Back to Ashes or buy me a coffee as a special thank you, all of that information can be found down below. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we go back to ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Stalker Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. A quick insert about that, I've gotten a lot of complaints about the first story being way too short and then that advertisement happens. The reason I do that is to go ahead and get the ads out of the way. That way you can enjoy the rest of the video ad free. If you have any questions, you can drop those down in the comment area. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. I worked at a mental hospital. A violent patient developed an obsession with me. He eventually ended up in a hospital for the criminally insane. Some time later, he managed to convince the board that he was no longer a threat and was released. Within 72 hours of his release, he had managed to locate my home address and my phone number. Hey, I said he was insane, not stupid. I began seeing him everywhere I went and getting hang-up heavy breathing calls. I started seeing him around my condo complex area, but could never get the police there fast enough to catch him. I quit my job and moved out of state, leaving everything I owned that didn't fit in my car. It was a good two to three years before I finally stopped looking over my shoulder. So, to preface this story, I was about 15 to 16 years old at the time. It was my best friend's birthday, and she invited about six of us over to play a few games, such as Mario Party, Mario Kart, Guitar Hero, etc., and stayed the night in celebration of her big 1-6. So, at this get-together, there was five girls, including me, and one boy. After a while, my best friend asked if we would like to go to the playground, which was about a 10-minute walk away from her house. Of course, being stupid teenagers, we agreed, not thinking of how it maybe might be dangerous, since the majority of us were young girls and it was currently 10 p.m. Anyways, we walked down to this park and continued playing Grounders when we arrived. Which, if you don't know, is a game commonly placed in elementary schools. The rules are, one person is it, the other person who is it must close their eyes and try to seek the other players as they hide on playground equipment in order to tag them. But there's a catch. If anyone gets off of the equipment and the person who's it calls grounders while they're on the ground, they are then tagged. Yeah, I know it's a very childish game, but it's fun. After a few rounds, we got bored and decided to huddle around in a circle in the center of the playground equipment. We were just talking, joking around, and when suddenly I heard what I thought to be something like rocks, maybe? It was hitting the chain link fence that resided on the back of the playground. I hushed the group. I looked over at my best friend, asking if she heard that, as everyone looked at me like I had ten heads. She asked what I meant, and when I told her, it sounded like someone was throwing rocks at the fence behind us. She responded with the classical, Ooh, it's a murderer trying to come get us. 
Naturally, I glared at her, flipping her off. She knows I get paranoid sometimes, but I have very good intuition. And something just felt off. A few minutes later, after some more rocks were thrown at the fence, and I obsessively stared down the area behind the fence, which was all woods besides the houses on the left and right of the playground. In paranoia, I noticed a light weaving its way through the branches of trees. At first, I thought maybe it was just a headlight of a car that was coming down the street that connected to the street of the park, since you can vaguely see the headlights of oncoming traffic through them. But I soon realized there was only one light and it was bouncing up and down like it was held by someone who was walking. I quickly pointed it out to the group around me, and we all snapped our heads over in that direction. Coming up alongside the nearby house on the left side of the park was a man who wore a hat, some white baggy and dirty sweatpants, and a black coat. He was holding a flashlight, not the one on your phone, but an actual flashlight. He was too far away to guess his age, even when he sat on the swings closer to the playground equipment we were on. But we all collectively agreed it was strange, since he seemed, I guess from his clothes, to be at least a mid-twenties and just came out of the woods by himself to sit and stare at a bunch of kids. After a brief discussion, we agreed that maybe he was waiting for a ride or was just resting for a moment. So we tried to brush the fact he was sitting and so intensely staring at us off. However, we started to take note that after a few moments of us resuming our very competitive game of grounders, that this stranger was slowly inching his way closer to our group. He went from sitting on one swing furthest away to the next swing a little bit closer to the equipment we were actually on, to the next, until he was just about ten feet away from our game. The whole time he just sat there watching. At this point, all of us have noticed the strange man attempting to get closer to us, and in an attempt to remove ourselves from a potentially dangerous situation, we made a group decision to leave. Getting up, we all piled off that playground equipment, and in pairs of two. We walked down the stairs on the side furthest from the creepy man. As we attempted to casually walk away, I kept my eyes glued to his figure, and as we neared the end of the street, he got up. Slowly at first, the man started to trail behind us, keeping his distance. I decided to keep my mouth shut at the same time, because we were about to make a turn. I thought that if he continues to follow us instead of going the other way, I'd bring it up to the others. And wouldn't you know it, the creep stays hot on our heels, not only following which turn we took, but he also started sprinting towards us, screaming, You mother effers, I'll effin' kill you! At this point, the whole group burst out into a sprint, and the adrenaline I felt made me run so fast, I was ahead of everyone else. Everyone was ushering each other to run. I didn't even take a second to see if the others were behind me. That was until I heard my best friend struggling to run. She has pretty bad asthma. I instantly felt horrible for running off on her, so I ran back by her side, grabbing her hand and quite literally dragging her along, repeating things like, Deep breath. You got this. Come on. We have to go now. Deep breaths. This whole time, the man was still running and screaming behind us and was catching up quite quickly. At this point, me and another girl in the group took it upon ourselves to get my best friend moving as fast as possible, both taking a hand and running at a pace she could keep. Luckily, this park was only about a ten-minute walk from my friend's house, if even that much. And as we piled in through her garage door, 
I turned to see the delusional man started running up her driveway. He got about halfway until our big fluffy savior ran to the open door. My friend's 100-pound, fully grown German shepherd. She lurched at the man, barking as we gripped her collar in an attempt to keep her from running completely after the man. Luckily, her sudden and loud appearance caused the man to freeze in fear before running away down the dark, lamplit street. We were terrified for the rest of the night and only managed to sleep after putting random items next to us. We even had a rake. But most comforting, our big, fluffy hero, just in case the creep decided to come back. So to the crazy creep who enjoys watching kids at the park and then chasing them home, let's not ever meet again. The time I was being stalked and harassed by a bunch of teen thugs in a car. I was about 12 or 13 years old. One time I'm walking to my psychiatrist for weekly appointments. It's a half hour walk and after dark. I enjoyed walking, especially after dark, when things were quiet, peaceful, and slow, and no one else was around. No, I didn't live in a dangerous neighborhood, nor did my walk take me through any dangerous neighborhoods. As I'm about halfway to my destination, a car, a Cadillac, comes driving down the street. Some people, both male and female, in the car are sticking themselves half out of the windows and are taunting me and jeering me as they drive by. I would like to insert really quickly, this person was 12 to 13 years old. Who has psychiatrist appointments that late at night? And what kind of parent wouldn't take them to that appointment? Back to the stories. A bunch of people in their late teens or early 20s. I ignore them and keep on walking. About a minute or two later, the same car comes down the street again, and those people are jeering me and taunting me again. I don't know who they are. Maybe they live in the neighborhood. I still ignore them and keep walking. Another minute or so goes by, and again, they come driving down the street, taunting and jeering me. Now I'm worried. They're circling the block over and over, deliberately focusing on me. As soon as they reach the corner and make their turn and are out of sight, I duck behind some bushes in someone's front yard and wait. The car comes again down the street, this time not seeing me walking down the street. They're not jeering. They pass right by me in my hiding place and turn the corner. I think they think I've finally reached my destination, one of the houses on the block, and went inside and as a result drove away. I thought wrong. Stupidly, I leave my hiding place and go back to walking on my way to my psychiatrist. I should have stayed there behind those bushes much longer because I hear the car approaching. They spot me and are taunting and jeering me again. They turn the corner. This time, I run towards my destination, but I know I won't get far before that car and those kids catch up with me again. So... To that effect, I decided to hide again behind the bushes in front of an apartment of an apartment building, this time resolving to stay there for good until the thugs in the car give up their screeching and searching for me. I'm hiding there behind the bushes for not long, maybe about 30 seconds or so, when the guy whose apartment it is pops out of the apartment asking what I am doing hiding in his bushes. At first, he probably thinks I'm a burglar or something, but I explained to him how I'm walking to my psychiatrist and now I'm being followed and harassed by a bunch of kids in a car, which was why I'm hiding in his bushes. The guy can instantly tell from the tone of my voice and my facial expressions that I'm telling him the truth. 
He can see how scared I am. Just then, the car comes down the street and pulls right up to the curb, directly in front of us. They look at me and the guy I'm with. Not a mean-looking guy. He's maybe late 30s, early 40s. But tough and serious-looking enough. He's not wearing a shirt, but he's wearing a sleeveless undershirt, which reveals that the guy's upper body is very well-toned, slightly muscular, and not fat. I'm looking at the car, and I realize that it's missing a few people inside. The car doesn't look so full now. The guy I'm with just gives them a mean stare. He asks me, you know them? I explain that no, I don't know them at all. I haven't the slightest idea of who they are. Just then, as the car is sitting there, about three of them approach, walking from the other direction. The car was traveling east to west. Those three were walking on foot from west to east. So, that's why the car seemed not so full. They were looking to escalate the situation. They weren't satisfied with just driving by and taunting me. They changed tactics. A few of them got out of the car up ahead and started walking towards me, while the ones in the car took another turn around the block. Their plan now was to physically trap me in between themselves and their car, perhaps grab me and drag me into the car with them for whatever reasons. But seeing my tough guy guardian angel with me, the kids walking towards the car instead got into the car and took off. The guy offered to stay with me for a little longer or if I wanted to, to duck into his apartment to stay there until I was sure that it was safe to continue on my journey. I had a feeling that this was the last I was going to see of those guys and their car and didn't want to be late for my appointment. So I thanked the guy for his offer, but declined, and decided to head on my way. The guy went back into his apartment and closed the door. I looked at the closed door and hoped that I didn't make a mistake by turning him down. The guy's offer for better safety, because I was still scared. Thankfully, I was right about not seeing the car again. The rest of my walk, I was unmolested. I reached my psychiatrist's office. I told my therapist about what happened. He insisted on calling the police. The police came and took a report from me. That's the last I heard of it. On my way back home, I usually took the same route that I came from, up the same streets and everything. But this evening, I varied my way home taking some different side streets to walk on. Never saw that car or those thugs again. If I hadn't ducked behind those bushes, I would have walked right into their trap, and God knows what they had in store for me once they had me trapped. I'm not sure if this is quite stalking, but I have a story to tell, and I've been drinking, so it feels relevant. So here it goes. When I was 16, I made the monumentally bad decision to run away from home and live with my boyfriend at the time. His name was Brad, 19. One of my best friends, who was my age, we'll call her Bethany, and her boyfriend, we'll call him Ivan. I can't even begin to enumerate all of the ways in which this was a horrible idea and a bad situation, but I was a very stupid teenager and it seemed adventurous and fun, and I was exhilarated by the lifestyle these men were living. My absolute best friend at the time, also my age, we'll just call her Christy, was dating a 20-year-old, Alex that was selling psychedelic mushrooms. He always let all of us have the first taste so that he could get a general idea of how strong they were and how to charge for them. For some reason that I can't even begin to recall right now, Ivan and Bethany were out of town and Christy and Alex were staying in the master bedroom for the weekend. 
There were several white caps in Alex's most recent batch, and those were the ones that we were eating. Over the course of a couple of hours, my boyfriend and I were growing restless with how long it was taking for the drugs to kick in, and stupidly ended up eating seven grams between us. It didn't take long after that last dose for me to start tripping, and it was a very hard, very uncomfortable, very intense trip. I remember that it took the drugs longer to hit my boyfriend, so he had to watch over me for about an hour while I had temporary psychological breakdown. I won't go into what I experienced during the trip because that really isn't the point of this story, but against advice, I ended up forcing myself to throw up everything that I could to end the trip as quickly as possible. Alex and Christy were already in bed. After I'd thrown up and was, for the most part, coming down, I went to lie down with my boyfriend in the dark, and that was when he started tripping. He was thinking very cyclically and repeating the words to tool songs as if it were Bible passages. None of this struck me as particularly odd for some reason. Even though I had never seen cyclically thinking to this degree during a trip, and the unfamiliarity should have set off alarm bells in my head, then the scary part started. One minute I was doing my level best to calm down and reassure him, and the next minute he was on top of me with my head between his hands trying to break my neck. He didn't try for very long, but I didn't try to run immediately after he'd stopped because I was between him and a wall, and he was much, much larger than me, and I was sure I wouldn't make it. Seeing no other option, I soothed him while I tried to construct an escape. He tried to break my neck twice more before an out presented itself. I have no idea how I surveyed this because he was absolutely physically capable of doing it. A short time after his third attempt to kill me, he somehow decided that we needed to get married. He picked me up and started to carry me, completely naked, into the bedroom that Alex and Christy were sharing, somehow convinced the one of them could perform a legal marriage rite. This was the best opportunity I've seen to escape, so I did. Before he could get to the bedroom, I fought him like a wild animal, clawing and writhing and screaming like a banshee. Finally, he lost his grip on me, and I fell, then scrambled into the bathroom and locked the door. I vaguely remember knocking over a chair as I ran to slow him down. As soon as I'd locked that door, I started to hear commotion on the other side. There was yelling and scuffling and unintelligible babbling, and then someone knocked on the door. I was absolutely terrified of losing my life, so I ignored the knocking and started trying to figure out how to open the sealed bathroom window. After about a minute of this desperate knocking, I realized that the knocking was coming from Christy. She's been yelling the whole time to open the door and let her in. That moment, I realized it was her. I unlocked the door without thinking. As soon as I swung the door open, I saw my boyfriend break out of Alex's arms about five feet away from the bathroom door. He knocked my friend out on the way as he ran to get me. Alex had thought that he'd completely immobilized him, but he was wrong. My boyfriend tackled me to the bathroom floor and redoubled his efforts to try and break my neck. I remember my head being twisted so far around that I could clearly see the tiny pits in the bathroom tile around me. I am incredibly lucky that Alex was there because... I probably would have died if he had not been. He yanked my boyfriend off of me long enough for Christy to crash into the bathroom with me and lock the door behind her. I was sobbing uncontrollably. 
naked, and bruised, and more terrified than I have ever been in my entire life. But she was clear-headed enough to impress upon me the importance of getting the fuck out of the house. The only clothes that I could find were a wadded-up black sweater with a cat decal on the front and a pair of men's boxers. Both were crusted with dried vomit. My friend finally managed to pry the window open, and we crawled outside. Covered in vomit, tears streaked and bruised, I followed her to a nearby friend, Melissa and Walter, house for asylum. I was utterly hysterical by the time we got there, but I managed to give my friend a basic outline of what happened. Walter left the apartment, exclaiming that he had to go find my boyfriend, and I absolutely understand that. I even somehow managed to understand it at the time. I knew that this behavior was the drugs talking, not my boyfriend, and that his safety was important. I won't say that I thought that he had as much of a claim to safety at that moment as I did because I was running on adrenaline and determined to survive, and not at all concerned with justice or rational fairness. But he definitely didn't deserve to be forgotten just because some drugs had affected him adversely. Finally, I managed to calm down on my friend's couch and stop hyperventilating. It was at this point that Walter arrived back home, and who does he have in tow? My psychotic boyfriend, wrapped in a black curtain with pupils the size of saucers. My friend sat back as he settled onto the couch next to me and started apologizing profusely for what he had done. I listened for a couple of minutes, my body as tense and rigid as it had ever been when he started to slip back into cyclical thinking. I learned then, through his ramblings, that he tried to kill me because he thought that God had told him that he had to kill me so that we could be together in heaven. After, I lost the ability to deal with the trauma and the stress, disheartened by my friend's inability to see that his proximity was putting me on edge. I jumped up from the couch and ran out of the apartment complex. I couldn't face another murder attempt, with or without my friend's presence. I ran all the way to another nearby friend's apartment and ended up staying there for the night, still covered in vomit and tears. I try not to think about how it's affected my life, but I'm sure it's had a very negative impact, and I'll never, ever forget it. Oh, and one more thing. I broke up with my boyfriend the next day. Man, I have a story for you guys. This experience has caused me a lot of anxiety, and it actually feels therapeutic typing this out just for you. During my freshman year of college in New Hampshire, a girl in the dorm hall accidentally caused a small dorm room fire by leaving popcorn in too long at like 3 a.m. We all had to evacuate and the fire trucks came and the RAs made a pretty big stink about it. The girl who lit the fire was the subject of many yik-yak jokes, and I felt bad for her because... She really, really wasn't attractive, and she looked pathetically lonely. And plus, causing microwave fires seemed like a pretty innocent mistake for such harsh comments. A couple days after the incident, I saw her in the resident hall and made casual small talk by asking her, how are things popping? And kind of just checking up on her, because I felt bad. She laughed, and that was kind of it. A conversation for about two minutes. Fast forward to a week later, and I heard a knock on my dorm door, and the same girl, who I'm now going to refer to as Popcorn, comes literally running into my room with no hesitation. I didn't even tell her my room number, and at the time, 
I just figured she saw me go in there once. Maybe she didn't even know my name at this point. It takes me a second to realize that she is in full-blown tears. There is now a stranger on my bed in tears. And I'm just like, uh... So, I counsel her like the bleeding heart I am and ask what's wrong. She tells me that the black dining hall cook sexually assaulted her and the college wouldn't fire him and she was suffering emotionally because of it. Being a victim of assault myself, I really sympathized with her situation and gave her my phone number in case she needed help walking to the dining hall with a safety net and what not. I do not take sexual assault lightly. The night after our conversation in my room, I got a call from her to walk her down to the dining hall because the black cook that assaulted her was working that day. I walked her down to get food, and she just lit up like a glow stick, and a whole new person emerged. I didn't matter that... What? It didn't matter that her assultant was in the room. She was talking my ear off about pretty little liars, one direction, etc. A lot of things I just didn't really care about, but then again, she had no one to talk to, and the situation was complicated. I just listened and nodded my head. Over the course of about two weeks, give or take, I had walked her down to the dining hall about maybe four to five times. She may have been a victim of assault, but she was also a very annoying and unappealing person. For God's sake, she actually talked about herself in third person. Her story about the assault became inconsistent, and there was always new major developments about what happened, and the story was changed to something much more drastic and severe. It went from assault to full-on gang as her story developed. Then she made a comment one day along the lines of how she wished that someone would drop a bomb on black people so they would finally learn to stop raping others. Made me immediately uncomfortable and unsettled. I didn't want to walk her down or interact with her anymore. The week of Thanksgiving reprieve, I went back to visit my family while popcorn stayed on campus. During the week, I had 60 missed calls from Popcorn. One day, I even had 20-plus calls in the span of a couple of hours. No normal person does that. Red flags definitely were raising if they hadn't been already. When I got back to the campus, there was a knock on my door, and sure enough, it was Popcorn crying again. She tells me that, because I wasn't on campus to protect her, she was raped by a Muslim guy while walking to Panera Bread, and the Filipino RA groped her and then slapped her boobs. If red flags were being raised, then this was full on sirens. I'm no rape apologist by any means, but the rape to ratio rate was exponentially high especially since these three assaults happened within a month time frame, all by people of color seemingly at random. She was making three stories up to elicit some sick form of sympathy, and as an actual victim of assault, I was beyond offended. I told her I had to leave for class and ran the fuck off to my friend to ask for advice. It got really crazy really fast. I warned the RA officers about her, and they told me they would talk to her. During class, I was up to a hundred plus missed phone calls and a series of individual messages that said, Hi. I was done with this shit. I wanted nothing to do with her. I blocked her number and went back to my dorm. That week after classes, I just went straight to my dorm. I did not want to see her. One day, I had to go to the bathroom, so I walked to the stall to do my business. I'm just casually in there peeing with my pants around my ankles when popcorn literally fucking crawls on the bathroom floor and dips her head underneath the stall door, saying, 
Ha! I knew you would eventually come out. I am freaked the fuck out at this point, and in near tears. I tell her I'm wicked busy. I don't have time for her, and that I was upset for evading my space. It took her a lot of courage to do because I struggled deeply with confrontation. She tells me all about how she is thinking of dying because her mom died when she was young. Some manipulative shit that I was just not in the mood for. I leave her in the bathroom and go to my room and lock the door. I watched some YouTube and took a nap when I was rudely awakened by not knocking but pounding on my door. I did not answer. The pounding just continued and continued and got louder. Open this door, I'm going to kill you. Open the door or I will kill you. Open this door or I will kill you. And she just waited and waited outside my dorm, singing songs into the door cracks for about an hour. I literally was so scared, I just cried and called my dad to pick me up from school. I didn't have many friends that lived on campus since it was a small college and a lot of people commuted. And this whole situation just made me feel isolated. My mental health was deteriorating rapidly. The RAs had been informed of the threats made at my door by other students, observing what had happened, and she was given a warning, but that was all. One night, I had my boyfriend, who lived three hours away at the time, come to spend the night at the college. We had been watching a movie and now were napping on my bed when all of a sudden, we all hear the door open. Like an idiot, I had completely spaced out and forgot to lock the door. Popcorn comes running in and jumped on top of us and says in a baby voice, Aw, popcorn want cuddles. I was beyond creeped out and was basically screaming, What in the actual fuck? My boyfriend, being the no-nonsense confrontational person, told her to get the absolute fuck out of my room. She told him that she would, and I quote, just go and die like her mother did when she was three and inject cancer into herself. My boyfriend smiled and said, good, bye-bye now, and then pushed her out of the room and slammed the door, giving zero fucks. Swear, he almost slammed her finger shut. I just love him right now. We reported her to campus police in the morning, and still nothing major came of it. That was until there was another popcorn fire in her dorm, not too far after, and she got kicked out. I wish that's where the story ends with her, but unfortunately, no. After she left the dorms, my resident life became a lot easier. I made a lot of new normal friends, and I was feeling a bit less anxious. One day, a girl in one of my classes invited me to go to the mall with her and to go get our nails done. Now, this nail salon had clear glass, so you could see the rest of the outside mall when you were getting your nails did. I'm all relaxed when all of a sudden, I see Popcorn's fucking face pressed up against the glass of this nail salon, and she is with a morbidly obese neck beard. I'm getting my nails done, and she is literally staring me through the window for a good 10 minutes with this man. To say that I was unnerved was an understatement. I told my friend what was going on, and we booked it out of there, and they tried hard to follow. In respect, that is when I should have actually called the real police. After the mall, I had a bunch of random friend requests from profiles with a small Yorkie dog as the profile picture and several message requests. I opened them and they are from Popcorn, asking me to be her bridesmaid at a Pizza Hut wedding that her and her fiancé were having in two years. You can't even make this shit up. There was another message about how she was so upset and I didn't acknowledge her at the mall and she had waited so long to introduce me to her doting fiance 
and she was so upset with me that she wanted to wring my neck. Of course, I blocked all of those profiles, and things went pretty silent. I've been living with my boyfriend and going to school in Rhode Island for two years currently. I'm loving school, and I have an excellent group of friends. About five months ago, I had got home from work, and I had three missed calls from a random New Hampshire number. Thinking it was one of my family members, I called back. And nope, it was popcorn on the other end. I immediately hung up. There was also a voicemail left that was just a person breathing into the phone and telling me that I was expected at the wedding. I cried and called the police urgently about this number. I don't know what happened or if anything did come of it, but I haven't been bothered since then. I'm a very kind person, and people often take advantage of my openness. It really is a fatal flaw that I am working really hard on. It's unfortunate that there are so many unhinged and lonely people, but we really shouldn't make it our burden to help them. Sometimes being nice can actually cause a lot of mental strain. So, to popcorn, let's not ever meet again. I was selling my old car. I had bought a new one. I posted it on a couple of selling sites and Facebook. I arranged two visits that day and was home alone. It was broad daylight, so I assumed everything would be fine. First one came, made an offer a little lower than what I was looking for, so I said I would get back to him later, as I had another viewing. The guy from Facebook pulled up in a blacked-out Range Rover, and three other guys got out. I opened the door, explained why I was selling the car. You know, when you just get a bad feeling, I wasn't sure why four people would need to come view a eight-year-old car. He asked if he could take the car for a drive. At this point, I was not going to get in that car with him. So I said, yeah. Take it. I shall wait here with your friends. He asked me to get into the car. What if he just took it? I said, well, it wouldn't matter. That's what insurance was for. I was not getting in the car with that guy. The three other guys left, didn't speak to me, just to themselves, and I couldn't understand, but it made me feel very unsure if the car would even come back. The car was not worth putting up a fight or arguing over. I was questioning my life choices when he pulled back up. He got out and offered the same as the other guys earlier buying the car for his daughter. He wanted me to get in the car with him to go collect the cash. I said I was fine. His friends could take him if he needed to go. But I had another viewing, and I would contact him later. I didn't want to walk back to my house as I had now decided to sell to the other guy as they were just giving me the creeps. He then offered more than honestly the car was worth if I went with him now. I said no and locked the car and started walking towards the main street as I had seen my neighbor walking down and shouted to him and his dog. They spoke to each other and then drove off. I texted the other guy and told him, the car was his, and he was welcome to come over any time to get it. Sorted out the V5, and off he went. That night, from my living room, the Black Range Rover came back and parked outside. I live in a cul-de-sac, so I am set back to where we had been. I told my husband, and he looked and said, that was strange. Then my phone started blowing up. I politely said the car had gone and that I was sorry, but I couldn't help him. The car drove off and came back again about 30 minutes later. This happened about three times that night, and it was a bit strange, but I didn't think anything more of it, as the next few days nothing happened. On the Friday, four days later, 
I finally work early enough to get back and get the dog ready to go out. We were going to head straight to the park and run like the wind. As I got to the end of the cul-de-sac, the same car pulled up, and one of the guys jumped out and said hello. I held the lead tighter, and my dog was thoroughly unimpressed. She gave a bit of a grumble, and then he asked if he could pet her. I said no, she is a guard dog and doesn't like to be touched, and went to walk on. He then grabbed my arm, and the dog latched onto his forearm. Cue his screaming, there was only one other guy with him in the car, and he jumped out and started to shout. This dog is the most placid and loving dog you have ever seen, and to be honest, it was a warning nip, as if she had meant it to really hurt. She would have gone through the bone if she was really pissed. His friend was shouting and pulling him away. I called her back and got her to sit. Just a few neighbors came out, and they went towards the car. I haven't seen that car since, but honestly, I wouldn't sell something that meant someone had to come to my home online again. So whatever their intentions were, I hope I never run into them again. So this happened a long time ago, but I've never forgotten it, as it was one of the strangest encounters me and my family have ever had. One time as a child, I went with my family to the grocery store. It was our monthly trip to stock up on groceries, so we were going to be there a while. I was about 12 at the time, so by the age I had a good enough understanding of how to read people. We started in the produce, and suddenly a strange man caught my eye. He was standing awkwardly close to us, sort of fake browsing the vegetables. His body language seemed off. He was standing with his back to us, but something seemed strange about the way he was postured. As we slowly moved down the aisle, he would slowly rotate so his back was always facing us. As we got a little closer, I could tell he was wearing those see-behind glasses. Those gimmick sunglasses that have hidden mirrors on the side of the lenses so you can see behind yourself. He had a dirty, gray zip-up jacket on and long, dark, messy hair. He had to be in his 40s. Our shopping went on, and wherever we went, I would see him standing there staring at me from across the store. He would keep his distance from us, but... He was always within eyesight, no matter where we were in the store. About 30 minutes in, my mom still hadn't noticed it, but he was starting to really creep me out. My mom didn't believe me at first. Eventually, we got to the refrigerator aisles, and this is when it got weird. Whatever aisle we were in, he would quickly pace past us occasionally. At this point... He wasn't even trying to look like he was shopping. My mom and sis were starting to notice this and also seemed concerned. At one point, we were grabbing something off one of the shelves, and I could see him just standing on the opposite aisle, peeking through the shelves at us. His sunglasses were still on, still, but now his hood was up. We started to walk faster and do some random zigzags around the store, to see if he really was following us, and to try and lose him. But he would always keep up, all in a very sneaky way at that. He would always be at the same opposite end of the aisle, but he kept up with us the whole time. By this point, my mom was concerned, so we pushed the cart up to the customer service area to talk to a manager about it. By this point, we lost him. We informed the manager, and she was very helpful. She actually went to go try and find the guy and talk to him. We waited at the counter until she paced back to us with a confused look on her face. She walked up to my mother and told us, uh, He said, you're his mom? By this point, my mom and sister were concerned. The manager rang us up and said we should leave, and then they will escort the strange man. 
We walked out to the car, staying close to our mother, when we were met with a horrible sight. The man was standing across the parking lot, across from our car, with his head slightly tilted and a big grin on his face. We floored it out of there, but we could still see him just standing there watching us leave. Whoever that guy was in those sunglasses, I hope we never run into him ever, ever again. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true stalker stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Sugared Spite, Samantha Place, Colt Stonewolf, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Christy Elias, Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Doba Khaleesi, Ada Smith, Les Crispin, Patty Sneeze, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for keeping Back to Ashes up and running and your support of me, because without you, there wouldn't be a me, and there wouldn't be a Back to Ashes channel to support. Thank you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.